So happy Easter to you. And uh, I got to try. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Just checking. Just checking to see. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, Easter's a, a strange time for a lot of folk. Anybody here at strange time for? Besides me? <laughs> okay, so what I've found over the years, um, and I've been a pastor, is that Easter is people's excuse to bring up all their questions. It's like, uh, well, what about this? Yeah, what about that? And, and it's a big time. Uh, let, you do a lot of business you know, answering questions. And I, I've gotten really tired of it. So uh, <laughs> people have taken Easter and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's almost like the perfect holiday to twist things around and make it whatever you want it to be. Right? And uh, and that's happened quite a bit. I I love this quote from uh, Frederick Buechner, who's an author from Vermont. He says, "We can say that the story of the resurrection means simply the teachings of Jesus are immortal, like the plays of Shakespeare or the music of Beethoven, and that their wisdom and truth will live on forever. Or." We can say the resurrection means that the spirit of Jesus is undying and he himself lived among us the way Socrates does, for example. Or we can say the language in which the Gospels describe the resurrection of Jesus is the language of poetry and that as such it's not to be taken literally but as pointing to a truth more profound than literal. But in the case of the resurrection, it simply does not apply because there really is no story about the resurrection in the New Testament. Except the most fragmentary way, it's not described at all. There's no poetry about it. Instead, it's simply proclaimed the fact is Christ is risen. So, what's that mean for us? Christ is risen. That there's victory over death, there's victory over our sin, that we can have a relationship with Christ and, and we can uh, follow him and that we can have uh, his uh, resurrected power in our lives uh, daily and that we can have victory over death as we sang about over and over again tonight, today, right? And uh, that's huge. So why is it everybody has all these questions? Um, Today, I am not going to deal with any of your questions. I do that all year long anyway, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I want us to look uh, from this passage in John 20 that was read to us all morning by you all, uh, and then we heard the children's Bible. It was kind of cool. Uh, my parents never used that. We had King James when I was a kid. We had, you know, King James was good enough for Jesus. It was good enough for us, you know. That's our motto around the house. And... Uh, so I want us to look at what does Jesus want to know this Easter? What is it that Jesus wants to know? What questions is Jesus asking this Easter? And uh, the, the first one is the one we heard about. Mary at the empty tomb, standing outside, weeping, uh, wondering what happened. Um, in grief, obviously, and uh, disappointment and sadness and all of these things, uh, having witnessed the crucifixion and all the goriness of that, and, and now, uh, like the children's Bible says, her best friend is gone. And so she sits there grieving, and it says Jesus uh, comes up to her, and she thinks he's the gardener, obviously, uh, and, uh, and he has a, a question for her. Why are you crying? I think that's the first thing Jesus wants to know this Easter. Why are you crying? What is it in your life that breaks your heart? What is it that you're carrying around with you that uh, defeats you and brings you to tears? Now, because in my family growing up, we had that unique combination of being a uh, German Cherokee Indian family uh, which meant we just fought with each other. But um, <laughs> we were taught not to cry. So we taught, we were taught that this Bible verse is Jesus is saying, why are you crying? 
like Jesus is yelling at us, you know. That's what I grew up with. And, you know, we had that, uh, you know, uh, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Oh, yeah. Well, now, that makes no sense. I'll give you something to cry about. You know, if Jesus had said that, Mary would have said, you did. That's why I'm crying. But, uh, yeah, why are you crying? Now, we obviously cry in grief. Um, and some of us are in the middle of that, even right now. Uh, we also have tears of joy, though, don't we? Sometimes. Just overcome uh, with, with joy, and, and we cry. Um, some of us, including me, I, we cry in frustration. We have tears of frustration. You know, you get into something and nothing's working. That's my new motto for life. Nothing works. I think so, neither do you. But, you know, that's another thing. But uh, you get so frustrated. And you know that things could happen and work, and it doesn't, and you're blocked at every turn, and you just break down in tears of frustration. Why are you crying? Why are you crying? Well, I think this is such an important question because it's, it, it demonstrates that Jesus comes alongside us at the, at the worst times, usually, uh, when we're most broken, most lost, and cares enough to ask, and cares enough to um, not leave us in that. Why are you crying? I think he wants to know that from you this Easter. What is it that breaks your heart? What is it that you've gone through? Uh, maybe you have a life of regrets that would make a Russian novelist thrive, or, you know, Without regret, there'd be no Russian literature, I think. Uh, just, uh, but, but maybe you've had a life of regret, and, and, and maybe there's just been big loss, or uh, someone you love just died, and, and it's an undesired loss. And I found, you know, this, I don't, I don't, I'm not meaning this to be sexist, okay, but um, I found that men, for the most part, accumulate losses. We go through our life, and every brokenness and every loss, we put in a little bag behind our shoulder and we walk on. And then we get another big loss and brokenness, and then we put that in the bag. And pretty soon when you get my age, which is really up there, then you're going, dang, this is heavy. It's just heavy. And uh, what am I going to do with it? That's when Jesus shows up. That's when he comes alongside us. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. As the Father loved me, I love you. Now, there's another question, though, in this. And uh, Jesus wants to know. What are you looking for? Oh, who are you looking for is the question. Who are you looking for? John 20. I would look at that and go, wait a minute, you got it wrong. It's, what are we looking for? Right? Doesn't Jesus want to know what we're looking for? I'm wanting my life to work out. I'm wanting things to go good. I'm wanting my relationships to be happy, trouble-free, uh, even if we have to keep them superficial. Um, I, I want uh, that perfect life that I saw um, in Leave it to Beaver episodes, really. That's the one I want. Uh, and... Uh, he goes, I, I'm not asking you what you want, John. Not this Easter. This Easter, I'm asking you, who are you looking for? Who is it that you're looking for? In your life and in your faith, we come here to this Easter celebration. Who is it that we're expecting to find? See, this goes right to the heart of what it is to be a follower of Jesus and that it's a relationship. And uh, it's not getting our beliefs all in order and, and checking things off. It's not being really good so we never embarrass ourselves or people around us. It's, it's, uh, it's not getting perfect. It's not any of those things. It, it's a relationship. Have you ever been in a relationship? 
You? Yeah. Two people. Okay. And they're in the middle <laughs> section. These people are all liars and hiders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't pay on the camera. We're, we're going to show them. But um, yeah, if you're in a relationship, um, have you ever noticed that the person that you end up with is never the one you were looking for? What is with that? And we've had, you know, I don't know, in the vicinity of 45 years of marriage, and uh, I know that I'm exactly the one she was looking for. <laughs> I got that down. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. And I sure wasn't the one her parents were looking for. That's for sure. <laughs> So are you the one or shall we seek another? As, as, as scripture says. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, that, I, I told you that um, when Eileen's mom was in her 90s, before she passed away, she called Eileen and said, Are you sure John's the one? <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> So anyway, but but um, when you're in a relationship, you have all these expectations, you know, what the person's going to be like, and uh, it could be a work relationship, uh, uh, it could be a friendship, it could be a marriage, it could be uh, any kind of relationship, and, and you, it's all the same, because you, you have these expectations of what they're going to be like, and then you, you move forward in the relationship, and you start to know each other, and you get all tangled up with each other, and guess what? Dang, I got the wrong one. Better bail out of this and go find the right one because this one's trouble. Right? That's why we change jobs every three months. You know, that's that's why uh, we move to different neighborhoods. That, that's why we jump in our romantic relationships. It, 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 is this who I'm looking for? And I think the same thing applies to our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes we believe certain things, we think certain things are going to happen, and this is if I, you know, I was told, if you accept Jesus Christ into your life, your life is going to be so good, and you're going to be so blessed, and everybody will like you, and your room will be clean, all that stuff, you know, and uh, so I, I did it, and then I was the same guy, following Jesus. My room was messy, people didn't like me, and nothing worked out, but I'm with Jesus, who are you looking for? You're looking for somebody to make everything perfect for you, make it trouble free? I don't know a relationship that's trouble free. Woody Allen, you know, the great philosopher, he, he said that uh, uh, really happy looking people are the ones you don't know very well. You don't know them. Oh, yeah, they're great. As you get to know them, yeah, trouble, just like us, you know. And uh, and Jesus said, who are you looking for? On Easter morning, who are you looking for? And it would say, Lord, I'm looking for you. And he said, follow me. Follow me. Walk with me. And that relationship begins step by step, discover that you're loved anyway. You discover that uh, actually when you're not able to love, he'll love through you. Isn't that a miracle? And, uh, and we begin to grow. And that brings us to the third question. And for this I jumped ahead one chapter, so sorry about that. Chapter 21. The last chapter in the Gospel of John. And uh, you all know Peter, the disciple, kind of erratic, probably bipolar, all those things, and uh, tends to violence and uh, antisocial behavior, kind of like me, you know. And, uh, and then uh, he's the betrayer. It's like Judas, Peter and Judas, two betrayers, equal. The only difference between them is one killed themselves and the other one Jesus came and found. Peter goes into the empty tomb, it says, he looks around, sees that the body of Jesus is gone and everything kind of there, and he goes, huh, and goes back to work. What is that about? He doesn't go to build a church. He doesn't go to do great ministry. He goes back to where he was before he knew Jesus. I guess this is over, this chapter. He probably thought, my wife was probably right, they're traveling too much. And uh, and so he goes back to his fishing. 
it's over. And Jesus comes after him and finds him at his work and uh, is talking to him over breakfast, ironically, and has a question for him. Do you love me? I think that's what Jesus wants to know this Easter. Do you love me? And I could imagine Peter thinking, oh, come on, you know, look what I did. I was, I, I was so confident. I thought I had this thing. You know, we were close and everything, and I'm a pretty strong person. And then I totally buckled and embarrassed myself. And for the rest of eternity, people are going to be reading about my betrayal. How do you like that? Replay it every Easter. <laughs> yes, we are. Jesus goes, do you love me? Well, what am I going to do about the betrayal? Nobody trusts me anymore, and all the others know that I'm a coward and I'm a flake. Do you love me? You know I do, Lord. You know I do. Some of us think, you know, where we've been or where we are now or what we've gone through, that sets up a barrier between us and Jesus so that we can't uh, we can't overcome it. So if the Lord came up to us and, and said, follow me, we could say, well, you, you, you don't understand what I've been up to, you know, and I've got a little history here and all those things. And, and Jesus seems so unimpressed with us in our histories, by the way, and our problems, and, and says, do you love me? Even if we willfully said, okay, I know what God wants me to do, and I'm going to go completely opposite. I'm just going to flip off God, give him the finger, and go my own way. And then what, what, where's God then? You alone out there? No. Jesus comes and finds you and says, do you love me? Yeah. You still love me. Or we may have gone the other way and we said, you know, Lord, I, I built a pretty good life here. I've done pretty well for myself. And... Uh, you know, I've taken care of business and uh, built myself up. I've got a great family. I've got a nice home. I've got a good work situation. No money in the bank. Uh, I, I'm not a bad person. I'm not as bad as, you know, people sitting two rows over. And uh, not like them, anyway. And so, you know, I'm pretty respected around here. And I got things pretty much together. Do you love me? Well, that's a dumb question, Lord, because you see, I, look at me. You know, I don't need help. I don't need help. Do you love me? You know I do. What does Jesus want to know this Easter? What questions does he bring to you, to me? What's he asking you? Why are you crying? Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Do you love me? I have an Easter homework assignment for you. I know you've got to go to brunch or whatever, you know, that's important. <laughs> the brunch we're going to is going to have the Easter bunny there. <laughs> that's how classy we are. <laughs> the real Easter bunny, not one of those fake ones. Uh, yeah. So here's your homework assignment. I want you to actually do this, okay? I want you to take a piece of paper later today or tomorrow, and I want you to write across the top, what does Jesus want to know from me? What is Jesus asking you? And then write it down. What does he want to know? Set aside all your own questions. Uh, these are what I'm going to talk to Jesus about that when I get a chance. You know, not, not any of that. And you may say, well, I can't do that assignment because I don't even have a relationship with Christ. I've never said yes to Jesus. I've never invited him into my life. I'm not following him. I don't have to do the homework. Ah. Yes, you do. That's the sound we do to our dog to get it to stop. Ah. So uh, that's what Jesus does too, you know, by the way. Ah. So um, yes, you still get to because he still asks the questions of us wherever we are in our spiritual life. Somewhere, nowhere, far away, doesn't matter. 
He has questions for us. And this Easter, I believe he wants to know from you. So that's your assignment. You need to write down, what is it Jesus wants to know from me? What is he asking? Maybe he's asking, why are you crying? And it's a chance for you to look at your life and say, here's why. And then he can remind you, the, the last chapter of the Bible says, I'll wipe away every tear. And there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more grieving. That make all things new. Maybe say, who are you looking for? Some idea of what I might be or some religious experience or something? Who are you looking for me? Or he may be just asking you really simply, do you love me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts and our lives and our minds and our relationships and our work and our, all of who we are. Even our hopes and fears, Lord, come, come into that. And meet us right where we are. And Lord, we invite you to know us. We invite you to bring your comfort and your love and your strength and your hope, all those things. We, we claim that. And Lord, we believe we're going to see the goodness of the Lord in our lives. It's like the psalm says. And so we ask you to show that to us this Easter. Thank you for caring enough to come and ask. And thank you for defeating death so we can live. We give you the glory. Amen.